uh, welcome today. We're going to be going over virtual reality, augmented reality, and 360 tours. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to create some fun stuff today and learn some tools that will be able to help you uh, as you um, create multimedia learning objects uh, for in your practice down the road. Just a quick outline. Uh, we'll go over AR, VR, and 360 tours. We'll talk a little bit about multimedia learning theory, theoretical foundations, and then it'll be hands-on from that point on. So what are VR, 360 tours, and augmented reality? Um, typically, when I teach this in the library, everyone gets a turn in the virtual reality room uh, where we have an Oculus Rift which is a completely immersive environment where you put on a headset and it completely blocks your field of view. And there are two small screens that display the environment that you're in, which depends on what, uh, what virtual reality app you're, you're running on the computer. That could be something like a video game. It could be an archeology span dig site. Uh, it could be uh, a whole bunch of different things. Uh, here's just one example of Google Earth in Oculus Rift. This one is an augmented reality system. It's the, uh, the Microsoft HoloLens. And this person, uh, I'll just start playing it. And I'm going to mute the audio. So this person is uh, reconfiguring a factory uh, layout. And in this case, they're adding some new equipment to it. And this person is trying to get a feel for where to put the new equipment. So he's using HoloLens as an augmented reality and overlaying the real environment with some virtual objects. In this case, the, uh, the equipment to see where it would go. Um, and then they make a call to a colleague, share what they're looking at in the environment um, that the colleague can see on their screen. Uh, and then in the end, you'll see in a few seconds here, oh, there he is sharing it on the screen. They, uh, the person goes back to their computer, order the equipment, it gets installed at the end here. And you'll see the layout on the uh, on the manufacturing floor with the equipment in place. Anyways, a pretty cool example of augmented reality in a practical setting. This one is a augmented reality interactive game uh, called uh, Dilemma 1944. It was created by a teacher at Kitsilano High School. Actually, I'm just going to start playing it here. Uh, while I talk a little bit about it. This uh, is actually something that the teacher created with a class that they were teaching. So uh, the teacher led it, but the class helped create the game um, and the materials for it. I'll just turn on the Second World War, where they become a graduating student struggling to decide whether or not to join the Canadian forces fighting in Europe and Asia at this pivotal time in history. Eris is available from the Apple App Store. Players must create an account, then use the search function to find Dilemma 1944. Eris directs student teams outside to the different locations in the story. When they get within GPS range, the game triggers various media and artifacts that can be collected into an inventory. The first plaque initiates a video that provides context and important background information for consideration by the viewers. Item icons augment reality by overlaying players' lines of sight with period photographs, connecting them to past kids' students through place and time. T 
teens then followed the map icons to adjoining Connaught Park, where on May the 3rd, 1944, school cadets paraded in front of Canadian military dignitaries and school officials. Students are placed in the center of the activity of this event, augmented in video from original film footage. Players navigate between the various game tabs, including the map, inventory, and notes, where they can record their own comments, make voice memos, and take photos. Original Canadian newsreels have been included, as well as interactive maps that use geographic information systems to help students consider the scope and impact of losses on families in the community. Players also have fictitious conversations with real Kitsilino students from 1944 who have different opinions on enlistment and conscription. Sometimes, such as in the case with Principal Jimmy Gordon, that message is deliberately ambiguous, making the decision that much more difficult. Students then pause the game, reflect on the experience, and respond to the dilemma by composing a letter to a loved one explaining their decision to enlist or stay at home. They are encouraged to exchange and evaluate each other's positions. In part two, students leave the virtual space of 1944 and return to the present day. They venture inside the school and scan QR codes to piece together what happened to the real kit students depicted in Dilemma 1944. As groups find them on the grad class composites, a connection is made across decades. They collect their pictures and record any comments, observations, or thoughts in their game inventories. Eris then directs them to the war memorial in the front foyer. In 1946, the school community erected a brass plaque commemorating all the former Kitsilano students who died in the Second World War and lists of all those who served. Students must determine which personalities in Dilemma 1944 died and which ones survived. The final QR codes trigger video interviews that tell their stories. One of a prisoner of war survivor, as told by a family member and the other by a veteran in his own words who returned to Kitsilino in 2015 to tell his story of enlisting in the Navy at 18 years old. Situated documentaries like Dilemma 1944 allow students to examine the complexities of past events and assess accepted narratives by providing them with different learning experiences that connect to place, space, and time. My thoughts, anyways, one awesome use for that would be uh, to learn about maybe the environment around your school and from a First Nations lens about what it was like before, you know, the uh, uh, settlers came in and, uh, you know, the different places for maybe gathering food or uh, where the where the sites uh, around Victoria, anyways, where the uh, seasonal sites were for different activities and things like that. That would be a cool way to learn. Uh, and sort of tie them to the location uh, and place that they're at, just as an example. So um, so this next one is using VR. I'll just start playing it for an archaeology dig site. Uh, and a prof at UVic took high resolution photographs of a dig site in Spain and then um, put it in using gaming software to get it into the Oculus Rift. And this uh, student is exploring the site with the rest of the class in the background there. Um, and I think what they're trying to do is figure out where they should dig next and identify places where they need to be very careful to not you know, disturb artifacts that are potentially under different places. Uh, anyways, very cool use of VR. Uh, one thing we'll talk about in our last topic is uh, a, a debate about technology, about whether or not technology makes a, a significant difference in learning for students. And one of the people argues that, in the debate, argued that it doesn't make any difference. You can watch a video of a lecture or watch the lecture in person. And research actually shows that it doesn't make a difference in learning outcomes for tests and things of that nature. Um, what I would argue, though, uh, and this is a great example of that, um, is there a significant difference between the person using VR to explore the archaeology dig site and maybe going to Spain? You may be able to argue that there is a difference, but let's just assume that there isn't a significant difference between 
the VR version and the, uh, you know, going to Spain. Uh, what the difference, at the very least, the technology is doing is that uh, there's no way that at UVic we'd have the money to take a class to Spain to go to the dig site. Whereas, you know, we can spend a couple thousand dollars on a VR uh, setup to let students experience that, that they would not be able to experience other than maybe photographs in a textbook otherwise. So, so that's VR. So 360 video, uh, the great thing about it, it is quite quick and relatively easy to create compared to using gaming software to stitch together images and make that uh, VR environment. 360 video, uh, you can borrow a camera from the music and media desk in the library, record, upload it to YouTube, and you've got a, a 360 experience quickly and easily and, uh, and inexpensively. One great thing about it is there's a heightened spatial understanding and immersion if you are able to use something like Google goggles uh, or Google Cardboard in your, you know, in your phone to uh, experience it. You can always view it in your, uh, in your web browser, of course. Um, here's an example of Finnerty Gardens. Maybe, let's see if it comes up. Well, it'll come up, just a matter of time. So there's me and I can scroll around to look. Oh, there's the top of my head. There's the gardens. I can pause it. I can zoom in, zoom out. It's actually pretty, oh no, it's high resolution. Anyways, 360 video. Uh, just show you one other one here quick. This is a, uh, I did this at the McHugh family reunion last summer. It's the annual uh, McHugh Olympics licorice eating competition. There's actually my daughter that just went off to her first job. There's Carl, he's the reigning champion, three years running. Uh, he will repeat again this year. And the reason why I did this, actually you can see the uh, tripod it's on. The reason why I recorded this is my mother was getting a minor surgery, surgical procedure in the morning, nothing major, but I wanted to record it for her. So I recorded it, so there goes Carl. And you actually have to swallow it all before you can be done. Carl wins yet again, puts his hand up. I'll just pause it there. But anyway, so later that night, uh, my mother was back. Actually, she was back in the early afternoon. We were met at uh, our house there. We got an office chair that was on a swivel. I loaded this video up to YouTube and then using Google Go uh, VR went to the YouTube site or YouTube video, this video where I'd uploaded it, started to play for it. And she was just sitting there sort of looking and I said, mom, spin around on the chair. So she spun around and she started to giggle like a little girl. She's 84 years old now. And at one point she started reaching out to try to touch things. And I had to explain, you can't touch anything, but, um, but she was able to relive that moment in a way that, you know, she could have watched it on a, you know, on a laptop or on the TV even and seen just part of it. But for her to be able to spin around using those goggles was qualitatively a much different experience and a much richer experience. She you know, almost felt like she was there. At least she felt like she was there enough that she started to reach out at one point to touch things. But um, yeah, so I did not win, unfortunately. There's me trying my hardest to finish it up. But, um, so anyways, 360 video. It's actually very quick and easy to produce compared to other elements, but especially if you've got Google Cardboard, which you could potentially have in a classroom, you'd need phones or something like that to do it. But uh, anyways, it's quite a rich experience that you can create. And at the very least, you could put it in a, a web browser like I'm doing here. So here's another one. This was actually a, um, a project by a EDCI, I think it was a 336 class. It wasn't a section I taught, but they went all out for this. They found a house that was being uh, going to be demolished. They got permission to put art installations there about climate anxiety. Um, and then they used virtual reality software that's used in real estate to uh, create a three a tour of their 
uh, of the art installation. And you can see here, you mouse over things. It gives you links to websites. You can go into the dollhouse view up top here so that you can rotate around and see what, um, say I wanna to go to the top floor here. I just click on that. It'll take me straight to this room. And again, there are uh, links to things. You can also embed videos. So if I moused over something, um, I, have to, I can't remember where they are, but you can actually watch a YouTube video inside of it. So if you wanted to go a little bit deeper, you can see, maybe imagine some instructional um, opportunities using a framework like this with embedded YouTube video. Uh, obviously, we're looking at this in a web browser, but uh, you may not be able to see at the bottom here. You can click on View in VR, so someone could navigate to this website in an Oculus Rift or Oculus Go, and then enable the VR view and then look at it in the VR goggles and look at the videos and the other, the other elements as well. Anyways, very cool. This house got torn down, so this is the only remaining artifact from that installation, which um, which is very cool on a number of different levels. Any questions about that or comments? Okay. So that previous, so this software, it's commercial real estate software that they used. It costs about $10 a month to host with them. Um, this next piece of software is an open source uh, open source software called, Mar called, Mar uh, called Marzipano. I'll just open up a, a little tour that we made of the uh, Digital Scholarship Commons. It does not have as many features. It doesn't have the dollhouse view. Um, you can embed information. So I can embed information and links out to other resources, but I can't embed YouTube videos very easily. Um, that said, it's free. Uh, and all you need is some web space, which as UVic students you have at the University of Victoria. So I'll just navigate here. So here's the VR room. So once the library is back open again, you can use the VR room here. Um, here's our teaching space where we normally have our workshops. We'll go to the offices. So this is our office space. My office is the next one down from that. Um, anyways, you can do a lot in it and it has the virtue of being free. So if you wanted to use this for a tour for your students or as an activity for your students, which would be wonderful given, you know, it would depend on their age, of course, uh, this is a tool that they could use uh, without having to get any licensing. There's no FIPA uh, issues with it because it's all local on the computer and then you'd have to arrange the hosting through the school district to do it. But, uh, very nice from that perspective, uh, not having to go through a whole FIPA uh, evaluation. Uh, next up is uh, Google Tour Creator. This is uh, similar to Marzipano. It's a Google tool, so you'd have Google, um, Google FIPA considerations. Uh, one nice thing about it, though, is you can integrate your 360 images with uh, Google Street View. So for example, here's obviously the library. This is a Google Street View image of the library. Um, and if I click next here, we'll go into a 360 image that we took inside the library. The difference, one of the main differences between um, Marzipano and this is that uh, it's linear. You can't choose the path you're going to take. If you can see at the bottom here, it has scene two of three. You have to linearly go through the tour. You can't branch and go forward. Well, you can go forward and backward, but you can't branch through your tour. It is hosted by Google, so you don't have to worry about getting web space. You do have the FIPA considerations, though. Um, yeah, so that's Google. I think it's called Google Poly, but it's basically Google Tours. The next one is Google Earth narrative maps. So you don't have the street view in this one, but you do have Google Earth maps. So if you wanted to tell a story with some locations, uh, uh, locations, you can do that. You can also incorporate 2D images. So I'll just open this up quick right now. 
Uh, I had a study leave about 10 years ago and um, you, I was able to do it online and I was developing some software. Um, so uh, anywhere, I could do it anywhere. I had internet connection and lived in Brazil when I was in my early 20s. So took my family there and then worked there. So this is, just click on this. Actually, there's two ways. You can click on the, the pinpoints here or you can go click on the right side here. And this, you can choose the perspective you have. So this is the house we rented. And then there's a some narrative with some pictures, two dimensional pictures that I took. I'll click on the next one here. This is a capoeira studio that we took some capoeira and jujitsu lessons. I can zoom in and out to sort of get some context for the location. So I'm just gonna zoom out a bit. This is the beach that was close to uh, our home in a national park. You can see here, this is the river that we had to walk through, just a little more like a stream to get to the beach. We had to walk through some sand dunes. And then eventually there's the beach where our two of our boys came close to drowning, unfortunately. They are fine in the end, but there's a pretty bad riptide that we weren't aware of that uh, sucked them out a ways before we figured out how to get them out of the riptide. But anyways, here's the video store that we rented videos from that can tell you how long ago it was, grocery store. Anyways, an interesting way to tell narrative uh, link to uh, location and allows you to sort of skip around between the locations if you want. So some pros and cons about using, um, you know, AR, VR, 360 tours from a multimedia learning principles perspective. Some of the pros would be uh, the multimedia principle. People learn better from words and pictures than words alone. There's the modality principle. People learn better from graphics and narration than from graphics and printed text. There's a redundancy principle. People learn better when the same information isn't presented in more than one format. Spatial contiguity principle. People learn better when corresponding words and pictures are presented near rather than far from each other. Temporal contiguity. People learn better when the corresponding words and pictures are presented simultaneous rather than successively. And the segmenting principle. Uh, people learn better when a multimedia message is presented in learner pace segments rather than as a conti contiguous unit. Again, that last one, the segmenting, that would be up to you as the author of the multimedia objects to make sure they're segmented properly, of course. On the negative side, there's the coherence, coherence principle. People learn better when extraneous material is excluded rather than included. Uh, multimedia environments, depending on how they're created, can be somewhat overwhelming. Um, so you need to keep that in mind as you create it. Try to focus it on what uh, you want the learners to get out of it and learn uh, so that they're not distracted by too many things in the environment. So when the library opens up again, you will be able to borrow equipment, even if the whole library isn't open. So in September, you'll be able to borrow 360 cameras and Oculus uh, Go, as well as uh, Google Cardboard uh, type. It's actually not cardboard, they're plastic, but they're um, goggles that you'd put your phone in. Um, so uh, as well as tripods, so you'd be able to create um, some videos if you or still shots if you wanted. Any questions about that? No? Okay. Uh, if you want to get a Digital Scholarship Commons digital badge uh, for, uh, for doing this, all you need to do is complete one of the Google projects and a Marja panel project, and then email the links to them. Uh, to me, I'll send you a badge that you could put on a LinkedIn page or your website. Uh, just one note, the Marja panel project files are quite large, so you'd probably need to share them with me via something like Dropbox or Google Drive. Uh, they're too big to go attached to an email.